Welcome to HD Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. We got a bunch of great stuff coming up for you in today's show, including a secret $2,300, $2,300, a secret $23 <laughs> headphone. You've got over-the-air antennas. Yes, how to get good HD TV for free. Oh my goodness, yes. this is a good thing. But first, let us talk about our favorite secret tool for cleaning up home theater installs, not zip ties or Velcro, which are both critical to a clean home theater install, but short cables. Yes. Um, Gotta love it. I don't know if you saw the label on that, but this is a, a box cables. I think this is like, oh, I want to say $15 in cables from Monoprice, and I'm getting ready to redo uh, the cabling on my home theater system. So we've got one and a half, three foot, and four foot cables. Nice. These sell for like two, three bucks a piece. Um, and it is amazing how much better it is to have, say, this connecting your Blu-ray player and your AV player than a 22-foot HDMI cable because that's the only thing that the big box store had in stock. Um, one thing I want to point out, when you're looking at cables, if you don't have room for the cables to naturally radius, when I say naturally mm -hmm. radius, you want a big, soft curve coming out of the back of your HDTV. Well, you know, if your HDTV is like this, great. But if your HDMI ports stick out the back of your Blu-ray player or your AVR, you want room for this to go like this. You do not want this jammed up against the wall like this. It will ruin the cable. It will eventually fail, especially if people poke around or shove around in there. Get 90-degree HDMI adapters or flexible adapters that basically rotate. Uh, I prefer the 90, uh, the, just the solid 90-degree HDMI adapters. If the cable falls off because of gravity, you can use heat shrink tubing to hold the adapter to the end. But just having super short idea. cables, especially like one and a half, two foot, three foot cables, huge, huge difference. Instead of having a rat's nest of cables or spending like three hours of your life zip tying things together or using Velcro ties in the back of your home theater, you just plug these and look, clean. It can also help Simple. with things like cooling as well mm -hmm. by eliminating a lot of bunched up cables in the back or the mess on the floor. That's the big one I always hate to see. So yes, they make short <laughs> cables, they're affordable, use them. And fewer cats caught up in your cables. I, yeah, I don't have the pet problem, but. <laughs> <laughs> you hate I understand, they, they love to chew on our cords. So what Mr. is it? Put they those put down there. Catnip in the plastic. I oh think. my goodness. Steve emailed <laughs> HD Nation crew thought you would be interested in this stat report at 56%. Apple TV takes majority of streaming device market share in 2012. Steve O actually sent a link to 9 to 5 Mac, which was reporting on GigaOM. Um, so basically, the idea is that look at this chart. This is a chart from a company called Frost and Sullivan. They do market analysis. 56.1% of the streaming devices segment is Apple, 21.5% is Roku, 6.5% is TiVo, and everything else is in that little chunk there. It looks like a lot, but 15.9% includes Google TV and Boxy and WDTV and Popcorn and everything else used to stream video, except for consoles. Oh. Yeah, so. <laughs> Not including consoles, though, but other than that, Apple has world domination. Well, yeah, it's kind of funny. I don't know about that. That same Frost and Sullivan report says 60% of consoles are used for over-the-top streaming. You're watching over-the-top streaming right now if you're watching HG Nation. That's the, the big fancy marketing term for it. And But it's kind of funny. That Frost and Sullivan uh, uh, report basically says 35 million consoles are going to be sold in 2013 just 2013, that's a big deal because Roku's only sold five point something million boxes, which means Apple sold maybe 12 million Apple TVs. And in 2013 alone, there should be more new consoles used for streaming video, like 21 point something million, on top of well over 100 million Xbox 360s and PS3s that are already around the world. So I'm gonna say Apple, with an installed base of 12 million, super awesome, but they haven't quite taken over streaming video yet. Totally, and without a doubt, they're making it very easy to get content off of their own device onto that wonderful little $99 box. So yeah. that's another reason it is so popular. Well, it's it also the Roku and the Apple TV, super easy. Like simple controls, simple interfaces, simple access to your video. It's, it's nice. It's a popular thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting article. If you want to hear like total marketing language, Frost and Sullivan analysis of the global consumer to video devices market, apps, QOE, and transformative user experience is key to growth in the price challenge industry. Um, if you're into streaming video, you know, and you have a lot of money, you can buy the report. But it's it's interesting just to kind of think about how many. You know, we asked on Techzilla how people are watching, and it was crazy the um, range of things from, you know, iPhones and Android phones and tablets and. Yes. TiVos and other set-top boxes too, but even a BlackBerry tablet, <laughs> one lone BlackBerry tablet. 
Hey, and while we're talking news, Sharp unveiled the world's first THX certified Ultra HD TV. We're talking a 70 inch panel that'll run about $8,000 or about five to eight Seiki 4K flat panels, but you should have much better color and even better backlighting on the TV itself. Now this is likely the Purios panel that we previewed at CES. They had behind, behind the stage basically in a, in a private room where you could go take a tour of it beautiful image quality for a 4K panel or really a 3820 by 2160 resolution. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Hopefully we'll get one in soon. The yeah. thing between, say, what they showed on the show floor for Sharp and having it go through the THX certification process, THX hammers on these things with several hundred particular tests where they come up with things that they regard as like, oh, you should improve upon this, or here's something that's not doing quite right that needs to be improved. Whenever you see that THX badge on a TV, that's something I always like to see, and I'd be really, really curious to see this premium panel show up in the stores for us to actually get our hands on and to actually put eyeballs on. Yeah, mid-August, that should be a fun one to nice. test. Over the air antennas? I'm telling you, man, the, the number of people who are abandoning traditional cable and satellite television subscriptions, AKA cutting the cord, it continues to grow. Now, one downside of being a cord cutter is access to live television programming. Or is it? Well, if you aren't too far out in the boonies, chances are you have access to free over the air, OTA, they like to call it broadcasts. Now, all HD TVs have a built-in tuner for receiving this broadcast digital programming. And all you need to do is add an antenna. But before you whip out the old rabbit ears, do a quick check online for what stations are in your area and what kind of antenna is recommended for decent reception. The website to check out is antennaweb.org. It is a terrific resource. You enter your zip code or address, and the site shows you the distance and direction of local stations, as well as the recommended antenna technology to consider for your particular setup at home. Now, it's, it's really, really nice in a sense. You could drop in, yep, enter the site, and then it just gives you a quick, oh, throw in a zip code, make up an address, and it gives you a full-on Google map with all the local stations. You could even use our address here, probably. There yeah. you go. And as such. Now, well, it's, it's one of the nice things about this, because in the early days, you would just get this giant list of, and it would be like, there would be a block of color based on the type of antenna you would need for the sort of distance and location of the tower. And the new interface you're looking at here actually gives you uh, like basically a, a direction, a compass direction to point towards and an idea of where that actual antenna totally. is. Totally, and if you click on one of the colored tabs though for that particular station, that will tell you what that means in terms of what antenna is recommended. Now, for small, generally unidirectional antennas, two of our favorites uh, happen to be the Waltenna and the Mohu Leaf. I really like it. I actually own the Waltenna at home and I find that it's, it's actually awesome. It's a super flat design that's designed to be hidden behind, say, a, a painting or a, a frame on the wall or something like that. You can even put it behind the TV if you like. Now, I have mine uh, hung up on a rarely used window and it performs like a champ at pulling in my local stations. Now, the wall tent is 35 bucks and it's an unamplified design. No power is needed other than that coax cable that's running from there to my TV's tuner. And there's really, it, but the fact that it doesn't have that amplifier though means that it doesn't have additional sensitivity for pulling in weak signals. Now, you could always add one separately. The other antenna we really love is something from Mohu. They have a family of antennas, including the $40 Leaf HDTV antenna. Now, it's similar in design to the wall antenna in terms of its flat, thin profile. Uh, the Leaf also supports that, and it can be hung on a wall just like the uh, wall antenna out of sight. Uh, Mohu also sells an amplified version of the Leaf as well, that, and you can buy a separate amplifier from them if you already have an antenna that you like and you just want to try adding an amplifier to it. Now, if you're feeling crafty, you can make your own over-the-air antenna. The HTPC DIY website has plans for an easy-to-assemble fractal antenna that claims to provide superb reception, and it's cheap to build. This is one I'm really interested in trying out myself. However, there are lots of other DIY antenna plans out there to try, and that brings us to a good question for the HD Nation audience. If you are using an over-the-air antenna, did you build it or buy it? And we want to know how you're getting on your free live TV. Do email us at hdnation at revision3.com, and we love the tweets too. Do follow us. At hdnation. At hdnation. Hey, we got this email from Edgar who wanted to show off his home theater setup. He writes, here are some pics of my home theater. I currently have a 22-inch Vizio M220 VA TV for my display and a Technics SA AX540 stereo receiver for my sound. Connected, I have my 13-inch MacBook Pro, an Xbox 360, and a Toshiba Blu-ray player. I love HD Nation and loving the long form coming back via tech feed. Keep up the awesome work. Signed, Edgar. Love it. Edgar, thank you so much. If I have one tip for Edgar's setup, though, 
maybe do a little wire dressing, get those wires off the floor <laughs> so it's easier to clean down there, especially with hardwood floors, man. That's just something. Getting all that. We just showed you some zip short ties. cable is zip ties. Cool. We're going back to zip ties well, now. You can get zip ties that actually have a little <laughs> screw in thing where you can screw, basically, you can screw the zip tie into the underside of your I, table or desk. Or I we just like do getting it, it all off the floor so you can at least clean quickly when needed. We could talk, we do an episode, of, we could like, we could do a segment <laughs> on pulling cables, we could do a cable on hiding cables, you know, stuff you, that's designed, oh my goodness. We'll like, do this. Trim Most alone, definitely. there's like 32 ways to hide cables in your hey. house. <laughs> Without a doubt. Mark, AKA the Vax Cat posts, Hey guys, I would love to hear a personal review from you all on either show on the Monoprice 8323 headphones. I hear there is a hack that makes them sound better than Beats. Hmm, bold claim. I'm too poor for Beats, so if these inexpensive <laughs> pair can give me 50% of the performance, I'm there. Thank you, longtime watcher here, the Vax Cat. Oh, Vax Cat, I'm gonna make you a happy camper. Look, let's, let's, I mean. This is, I'm excited. This is the most popular expensive headphone on the planet, right? The, the, the Beats by Dre, zillions have been sold, and I can name dozens of headphones I'd buy long before I'd spend 250 or 300 bucks on Beats by Dre. Dre is a Hall of Fame producer and rapper. He is amazing. He and Jimmy Iovine, his kind of partner in Beats, just radically changed music production in their own way across the space of 30 years. Amazing albums, but Beats are a triumph of marketing, not audio quality. If you want noise-canceling headphones, get Bose, the, the QC15s. They won't sound as muddy or as sloppy or as meh as the Beats. If you want an amazing $300 headphones, uh, look at PSB's M4U1, Sennheiser's Momentum, Vmoto's Crossfade M100, which deserves an extra look if you travel a lot or tend to chuck your headphones in a bag. Um, the construction on these is burly. They come with a case for the money, and they snap up super tightly. I've been torturing this pair for months, and they're holding up better than any headphones that have ever been stuffed into my backpack. Um, I have not personally yet heard the PSB M4U1, but Jeff Morrison over at the Wirecutter put together an amazing panel. Um some really serious audio geeks and not so audio geeks to listen to all these headphones, plus the Biodynamics DT990 and the PSB. Uh, the PSB M4U1 took the, basically took the crown, in part because they didn't offend anybody. They weren't necessarily everyone's favorite, but nobody had anything bad to say about them. I've heard all of the other cans on this list, and it's a really good list. Of, if you're spending that $250, $300 range, um, look at this article on the wire uh, cutter, best $300-ish headphones, because there are some fantastic and amazing sounding headphones on this list. Um, DT990s, I own a pair of the 880s. Um, I have heard the Sennheiser Momentum, they sound incredible. Um, and it's also a great article just talking about the process of reviewing headphones and because people listen to different kinds of music and different kinds of music sound better on different headphones. It's just a fact of life. Now, let's talk about the Hi-Fi DJ style over-the-ear pro headphones from Monoprice, AKA the 8323s, also known as the 108323 on Amazon.com. These things, are ridiculous for the money. Uh, no, it's, it, I cannot believe they cost 23 bucks. Um, okay, terrible plastic on the ear pads. Um, you know, they are fully plastic construction. I don't think there's a natural material in here except for the copper and the wire. But it's kind of funny because when you open the box, you have an eighth inch to quarter inch adapter and you have not one but two cables in the box. So it comes from the factory. This $23 headphone has replaceable cables. So they give you a light cable for using with your uh, portable devices and a heavy cable for using in home listening for $23. Um, they sound shockingly good. I listen to them with my iPhone. I listen, them, uh, listen to them with the Astle and Kern, uh, uh, the AK100. This is a $600 uh, audio player. There's a whole lossless bunch of support. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> a little beyond lossless. It's, there's like 96k uh, tracks in here, 192k tracks. I've seen tracks. people's eyes light up around the office just trying on these headphones, and when they hear the price, they're like, oh, okay, and then they're quickly online shopping away. So. Yeah, I mean, so you've got to. Uh, I think I owe it to myself to have one of those around, just a good backup pair. It, it may turn into the regular pair. The way they <laughs> yeah, I mean, traditionally, like, I'm a huge fan of of, of Grado's uh, SR60s. It's a or the the it's a fantastic headphone, but 23 bucks. These sound. Amazing for 23 bucks. I listen to classical, I listen to box sonatas, I listen to some classic rock, I listen to some punk rock and country. You know, are they as detailed? Is the presentation quite as rich as a $300 headphone? No, but it's pretty good sound staging and shockingly good highs uh, and mids. Bass was solid. There's sort of a mid range section that felt a little sloppy, but 
Um, vocals still sounded good, and I've heard as, as you play these, as you sort of break them in, uh, they start to sound better and better, or maybe you just start to enjoy them more and more because you realize you've spent no money on them. <laughs> you can um, still afford to eat and pay rent. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, the Audiophiliac did a review of them and loved them. Um, Till uh, from Inner Fidelity, who's a fantastic headphone reviewer, he's the guy who started uh, uh, Headroom, the headphone uh, amplifier company. Uh, he wrote about them. They sound amazing. Now, they sound amazing for 23 bucks without modding them. That said, 23 bucks is cheap enough that you can start modding them, and if you screw them up, uh, you can get another pair and not feel too guilty. Um, Amagus posted this list up on HeadFi, which is a great headphone resource. Uh, spray rubber in the cups, or just apply nail varnish along the cup rim and baffle to get a better seal. Dynamat or similar uh, on the driver. Acoustic foam on the bottom of the cup. Mine is a heavy rubber bottom with foam layer on top. A piece of velour felt cotton on top of the phone. Micropore tape over the base vents in the cup which already have a thin felt over them. So basically the idea is to start tuning these like you were tuning speakers. That's pretty cool though that there's already a community of people who have ideas on what to do to make them sound even better for the money you've spent. Or in another case more comfortable, awesome. uh, this guy over on Head5 put together like, you know, a new headband pad uh, and the biodynamic velour pads. I would say uh, that's the first thing I would do is like putting a better ear pad on these uh, and a, a cable improvement. And I can't find it. Somewhere I found somebody did a crazy mod where they basically, you know, it was like truck liner on the inside of it. People are talking about cutting out the back panel and replacing it with wood to give it some more presence and some more feel. It would look go, pretty cool too. Yeah, it would look pretty cool. People go nuts with, with, with speaker and headphone mods. And at $23, and it sounds great to begin with, this would be a fun one to play around with. Go buy them, avoid the beats. Save yourself hundreds of dollars, get really good audio. Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on this one. Robert's on a 297 posted on YouTube. Hey guys, can you actually use a projector as a TV or should they be kept for movies only and a separate TV in addition? I love the show, thanks. And Joe followed up with another comment right below that one. It, projectors have lamps that don't last very long compared to an LCD, so don't recommend using it as a TV. And yes, if you have a PC and a TV tuner, you can connect a projector. Well, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Look, as somebody who's been using the same lamp and the same projector for the last three years, now admittedly, we have sort of reduced viewing time in our house. We don't run our, our projector or, or television eight hours a day. You can use a projector as a television just fine. The television looks just fine. The lamp thing, I wouldn't get too upset about that. Yes, lamps wear out. Um, but so do the phosphors on plasmas, and so do the phosphors on CRTs. The only difference is, is eventually a lamp will go out or break, and then you have to replace it, and it's like 200 bucks. So know that going in. Yeah, you can use a projector as a TV, and I encourage it, actually. It provides far greater flexibility in terms yeah. of creating the perfectly sized display for your room. Between the projector's lens and positioning it within the room, you have an almost unlimited selection of display sizes, so you can perfectly fill that space on the wall with the image you want. Now, Projector Central has an excellent projection calculator that'll show you the setup for given screen sizes and distances for particular projectors, and I think it's really worth checking out. If, you, if you're thinking of buying a projector, go look at that particular calculator for that projector first to see where in the room will you be able to put it for the given screen sizes you're using and even for the screen types, and it'll give you a recommendation overall if it's going to be able to put out enough light to handle the room you're putting it in. And as Joe noted though, lamp life can be much less than an L LCD or plasma television. Nowadays, the TVs that we're looking at claim 100,000 hours of life before they're half bright. Uh, we, we haven't had the time to test that thoroughly, but <laughs> that is what they're claiming. And compare that to say LCDs that can last for several thousand hours, generally right. speaking. Some last much longer. Some, of course, may be defective and last much less. It's really how you take care of that right. lamp. Also, there are lots of new projectors you'll see coming out that are not only LED-based. Some feature these hybrid lighting systems that use a combination of yeah. maybe a green laser with LEDs to produce the light needed to drive the projector. Also, LG's got the brand new Hecto projector. That's all laser-based, <laughs> and we're really interested in checking that out. Yeah, I mean, you should if you buy a projector, you should keep a spare bulb. Uh, with it because eventually what's going to happen is it's going to be like Super Bowl weekend It's going to be the Super Bowl It's going to be the kickoff and that's when the lamp's going to go or when you have a room full of you know Small children waiting to watch a movie. That's when your lamp goes that said I think I've had my projector for three years uh, And I still haven't replaced the bulb uh, by the way if you've been looking for an affordable projector uh, I gotta say something, dump on our flat panel for the Optoma HD20 uh, we bought on Refurb, HD20, HD180, basically the same projector. The best thing I've ever done at home for our home theater because um, you're looking at the difference between a, you know, at the time when we bought it, a 70 inch HDTV was still like six or seven grand. 
uh, and we picked up the projector for six or seven hundred dollars. Now you can spend more money, but oh, without a doubt. But well, it, look, I mean, it, a it, larger it, image does yeah. so much for the viewing experience. We, uh, we looking at a have, forty-two inch ten eighty p screen yeah. versus a ten foot wide image, yeah. it, there is no comparing that. You're not seeing all the detail on a forty-two inch screen no. unless your nose is right up on it. But it's amazing. We don't have a huge living room. It's maybe twelve feet wide by like fifteen or eighteen feet long. We have a twelve foot screen at one end with, with surround sound. It's amazing. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, check out uh, Lifehacker. Did a really good uh, uh, roundup. Alan Henry wrangled the high five vote over projectors, Epson's Powerlight Home Cinema, Cinema 8351, uh, and they had a pretty good list. These are all pretty fantastic projectors from uh, Epson and Optoma. Uh, they pretty much own kind of the low end. There's some others we might add in. Which reminds me, it's time for us to politely beg JVC and Digital Projection for some high-end projectors to review because it's amazing how inky the blacks can get. Now, it's, it's a jump from $1,000 to like $5,000 is a big jump for a projector, but you get incredible blacks and the image starts getting much more intense and the lamps start getting much brighter and the colors start getting really fantastic. Big financial jump, huge improvement in color and blacks. Digital projection has one of those LED yeah. based lamps in one of their newer projectors too that we would just love to show you. One of the benefits of an LED system too is that it, it, LEDs pulse on and off very quickly. So when the, t when the screen is gonna be displaying black, the, it actually shuts off the LED array so black tends to be very, very dark, and you end up getting some of the highest contrast ratios of any projection technology that we've seen to date. So it's another good reason to, to consider that if you're looking into the higher end of projectors. Twitter.com slash HDNation is our Twitter feed. We love to hear from you. Please subscribe to TechFeed to get our show on your YouTube lineup, or go to revision3.com slash HDNation if you want to subscribe to any of our regular RSS feeds. You can watch us on Apple TV. You can watch us on Roku. You can watch us on your phone. You can watch us anywhere, and of course, you can watch us on YouTube. Uh, Revision3.com slash HDNation. HDNation awesome. at Revision3.com is the email address. And where can people comment on YouTube? And you know, <laughs> yes, comment right below. And actually, any post, you can put your comments, questions, or suggestions right down below. And as always, until next time, thank you for watching.